You had in here Tulsa Public Schools listed as with deficiency. Last month you told us that they were found to have violated 1775, correct? Correct. So you 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 and your team led that investigation and they were found to, to break the law, correct? Yes, okay. Sir. I make a motion that we change Tulsa Public Schools accreditation status effective immediately to with warning. Second. What does that make a motion with the rest of the whole office? No. So there may be some districts we're going to pull out individually because there's so many. That's why. Now, is there a possibility, and I don't know if you're prepared, I would think you are, uh, with showing the evidence of those violations, uh, because I think that's what the community is also asking for. Sure. So if I thank you for that uh, question and opportunity. So we have um, issued a letter that, in my opinion, details what the complaint, um, as it was submitted, what the issues were. There were actually two issues in the complaint. One, uh, the district was found to be in compliance with, and then the other, um, I think we've heard about this morning. We did review that uh, information in the complaint. Um, it related to a training for staff, as I mentioned last month. In my opinion, it was a close call. Um, I, I recognize there's a disagreement about the conclusion, but the review team here did not only look at the complaint information, the district submitted their response, uh, the training slides were provided, and then uh, we requested access to the audio that accompanied that training. The vendor has claimed the audio portion we were given a limited license to use it for that one purpose. So I don't believe I have access to it at this point. But we did um, go through that audio with the training slides, and that was what led to our determination that there was a violation um, of the statute. Can you speak to the section of the statute that, was, that you felt was violated? Yeah. Uh, so in the letter that was submitted to the uh, school district, went through those, uh, I believe there are eight different subsections in the statute. In our opinion, there were really two at play. Uh, the first one was uh, the individual by virtue of race or sex uh, is inherently racist, sexist, oppressive, consciously or unconsciously. In the letter, we say this, there were no overt statements to that language in the statute, but the administrative rule that was promulgated says if the training which is prohibited as a part of what uh, the course, which is what the, the language of the statute is. If the training includes, incorporates, or is based on any of those eight, then it's a violation. And that's where it, it went on the other side of that for, for us. So to be clear, it's not necessarily that it's in a specific curriculum, um, that the administrative rule specifically also addresses these kind of scenarios which you're speaking to. That is and correct. And therefore it deems violation of this law. That is correct. The administrative rule defines uh, the term course to include staff trainings. So not in a classroom. So I have a statement and a question. Um, I did appreciate the representative from Moms for Liberty which said we believe in facts over feelings. So, Mr. Clark, would you say that it was your interpretation and feelings to determine what this training was based on versus the evidence of something explicitly being stated to showcase what this training was based upon? I do agree with that. It was the interpretation and going through that uh, training, the audio portion particularly. So, as a board member who was required and is required to vote on this, I did not have access to the audio. I did have access to the slides. I did have access to the complaint. And in the complaint, um, the teacher stated that in this training, that the statements were specifically to shame white people for past offenses in history and state that all are implicitly racially biased by nature. Um, and even in the statement that we received back from the State Department in response to this, you did state what you just said, that there were no uh, clear expressed statements of any of this in the training or the audio that shared that. 
And I, I have concerns, A, with the fact that we as board members were not provided with all the context to make a decision. And secondly, the uh, confusion of implicit bias and someone being inherently racist. Implicit bias is something that we all have. The teacher who complained stated that this was specifically speaking to white people. But in this training, what I see is that it also explicitly states that we all as individuals have implicit bias. It's not inherent by nature, but it is based upon our lived experiences. I have an implicit bias against cats because they were put on a trampoline with me as a kid and scratched me in the face. And so like I have this inherent fear of cats. This is explaining in that training the same concepts of things that we experience throughout our life that can impact how we show up in the classroom. And as a former educator, um, as a parent who is sending my child into this district next year for pre-K, I appreciated the fact that these conversations are happening at a level in which teachers can explore and unpack what is happening within their own lives and how that shows up in the classroom. I do not at all see a violation of the law. And I also, you know, as far as this board's responsibility and oversight and implementing the law, we A, need access to all of the evidence of the violation. But secondly, there was a statement made about who is the body that makes the decision. It cannot lie. And I appreciate your perspective, um, Mr. Clark, but your lived experiences impact how you provide what is true in the law and what is not. And so I, I, I cannot at all say that this district um, is accredited with warning, which means that they seriously detract, that the violation seriously detracts from the quality of the school's educational program. How can one teacher's feelings of guilt or shame detract from the quality of an entire district school education program? I do not agree. And also, I think it would be important to mention, too, um, that the requirement stated in rule is deficiency. Correct? That is correct. For the Not, it, it, well. it, it's already expressed there. We are following those rules, which actually were approved and then codified through the legislature and signed by the governor. Co correct. And so to move off the recommendation, this is why every single piece is um, vetted through the role of the Department of Education because you are not going to have the actual evidence of millions of different data points or um, ex various accreditation sheets, um, reviews, minutes of meetings. It is a recommendation that comes as a whole package to the board based on the law. Of course, you can reject that or accept that. But, yeah, but we do have to follow right. the rules that are so, in place. So to your point, the, the permanent rules have been codified. Actually, and I'm not quoting verbatim here, but say something to the effect of the board at a minimum can move to deficiencies. Am I getting that correct, Mr. Jett? That is correct. I okay. So the deficiencies is at a minimum. The rule does not limit the board's decision to go beyond that. So Brian, can you tell me, or um, Board Member Bobek, can you tell me what about this violation seriously detracts from the quality of the school's educational program? Yeah, I, it, in my opinion, it violates because whoever took it was going to be biased and or potentially. Who so in my, what? the training. So in my opinion, I respect yours, but my opinion is that warning is warranted and my motion stands. Okay, you said your opinion is that whoever took the training is going to be biased. That's what you're, you're part saying. Part of, yes. But bias doesn't equate to inherent racism. Can you put slide two from your, from your presentation, please? I think it's two or three. So I'm, I'm just curious if, if, if we have a level even understanding of implicit bias as board members and inherent racism, and maybe this is why some of this content should be taught in schools, because I just don't know that we all have a shared understanding of definitions and language here. So I, I want to clarify that 
we do not, or as a department, you're saying that we normally can go from deficiency, bypass deficiency, and go straight to warning. That's what that the rule says. Well, yeah. the Rick, Rick. That has I'm happened in the past. Western Heights is the yeah, example I would yeah, go Yeah, Western to. Heights was a precedent, and Mr. Jets verified. Would you agree? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. The ruling on the, the rules, the wording on the rules, I, at a minimum. I didn't have that, but I'd certainly respect Travis. Oh, okay, opinion. thank you. Uh, I'm not going to interfere with that advice. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Who wrote the content of the training at issue? The third party vendor uh, who was contracted with by the school district. And does the school district provide 1775 to that vendor to let them know the law that applies in Oklahoma? Mm -hmm. Good question. I'm was not it, aware of that. I don't know one way or the other. What was the date of the, the training? Training. I, I, I believe it was important. August 2021. Was it before the, the permanent rules were in effect? Yes. Okay, the so I think that's very important contact. Did the district review content of the training in light of the law that went into effect before it required the teachers to attend? Did, um, to add to that, uh, in the response district, which we have released, uh, they identified that they will ensure that the trainings going forward uh, make clear um, that gives reason to think that this will not happen again in my mind. So is that an admission that um, they recognize there might be an issue here? No, it wasn't that way. So I'm sorry if, it, if I said it that way. Yeah. It was not a recognition at all. In fact, they uh, put forward an argument for why it was not a violation, uh, but then uh, said to ensure further clarity, we will work to uh, make sure that that, as Ms. Uh, Williams Bradley said, that um, line of implicit bias does not equate to a perception of being racist. In a world of social media where there's more content and more information from the individual's um, self, um, really in putting themselves in that position of acknowledging, um, there's evidence that the superintendent has said she will continue to behave in this manner and continue to violate 1775. Is that so? I don't know. I, I'm not um, too keen on social media. Uh, <laughs> if anyone has, has happened to look, <laughs> I'm not active at all. Um, but I, I only know what they put in writing. Mm. Are there whistleblower protections baked into this law or our rules, or is it that are specific to 1775, or is it just regular whistleblower uh, protection? Answer. Sorry. Sure. Uh, yes, in the permanent rule, and it was in, uh, I believe it was in the temporary rule as well, uh, subsection L uh, talks about whistleblower protections, and subsection K addresses retaliation. And does it, does it require the districts, and I just don't know the answer to this question, um, the district to, to do anything specific to protect whistleblowers in terms of uh, reporting avenues that they make available, or is it is it more vague than that? Uh, it's it's more vague than that with respect to whistleblowers. Uh, it says that the whistleblower will be entitled to the protections under 70 OS 6-101.6b, uh, and so there's no you know specific procedure of if you have a whistleblower, you need to go here and do this or that. It's a more general provision. Okay. Is and I, I do think it's important to recognize, though, com complainants or individuals that um, do email are subject to open records. So there, that certainly has, uh, I think, is a point that is part of this context. So I, I do think that I don't think, uh, that's been mentioned, but. This is not a whistleblower. This is a this is an individual <clears throat> who lodged a complaint that should have gone to the district first, but they explained that they had difficulty finding. Well, keep in mind also that the or law could does not require gone. them to go to the That's district. That's right. They can You're right. straight here. Yes. So we need to clarify that. So also, I want to mention the reason why I brought brought up 
not only social media, but also the evidence that's presented. I personally was in the tier of accredited with probation. Why? Because of the deliberate and unnecessarily, unnecessarily uh, violates one or more of the regulations. And we've seen this district, not only with 1775, but in other ways, uh, violate the opportunity for these students to get exceptional quality education. And, uh, and there's evidence of that. So that's where for me, that's where I stood, but I can get to the fact that accredited with warning uh, is sufficient in this case, because we need to send the message that the deliberate breaking of a law uh, needs to be in probation. But at this point, I can definitely stand uh, with a warning and making sure that this doesn't happen again. And <laughs> Tulsa being one of the largest districts, other districts, our state is taking a look at how we're handling this. And if we're just going to bypass and do just a deficiency, we're not following the law. And that's what we're here to do. So if I, if I can, um, well, I'll get there in a moment, I hope. No, you're, you're okay, I think. Uh, Tulsa has had a, another complaint prior to this one. You might remember that. And in that instance, there was, in our minds, clearly no violation. Uh, we've also had a complaint. Um, look, the allegation was, look at their ESSER funds and how those have been expended. Um, our review team has combed through a volume, significant volume of documentation, looking at HVAC projects across their more than 70 sites, and not only didn't find a violation, but found them to be uh, in full compliance with those requirements. And so I can just, you said warning, but probation, these are the topics where we are with probation. Uh, just a comparison. And so I would offer those examples. 1775 is somewhat unique. Oh, we, we I, don't have a 1775 complaint or violation or investigation ongoing. Am I correct? These right here? These have. Is that agreed. correct? No, is that correct? Violation. That is correct. Yeah, but, but they're not 1775 violations. It's a distinction. Are you, uh, are you so, saying that 1775 is not egregious? Uh, not in comparison to special education. No, I'm, not comparing. I'm, not, I'm not asking to compare them. I'm asking if you think it is or not. I, I actually, as you know, I voted no on the rules and implementation. So you don't, you don't think it is. Okay. Okay. Just and for, so that is correct. Point. Okay. I, however, while we're discussing changing this item and what we're voting for, I'm curious as I look at what's written on the agenda, it says possible action on the recommendation. So do we as the board have the ability to change the recommendation that you brought before us? Yes. As recommended, Absolutely. it's not a yes or no? Correct. It's not they can't pull it out? Correct. Uh, no, no, they can, pull, they can pull it out. Uh, it's the board has the ability to, under the administrative rules to, <clears throat> to, analyze the recommendations made by the department. It is the board as a whole that ultimately makes the decision. And I, I feel confident that the open, uh, that for purposes of open meetings, that the agenda item is broad enough. I, I don't have concerns about that. Does it make a difference to you um, that this was not an employee or a staff member or um, anyone that was under the, the um, employment or by contract with um, other than a, that did this other than a um, vendor that um, acted independently, or does that make any difference to you? Do you see any distinction between I'm just asking Mr. Bobak. I do. Not so, actually. His investigation has said that they they broke the law. I, that's what declared they needed from Brad. No oh, he said you had evidence. He didn't have evidence. He said that he implied and inferred from listening to the recording that this is what the so training this, was based I'm just on. Curious. Therefore, that's not he evidence. Doesn't. Well, he said there was audio. Yes, that he had to make an inference from based on the audio that never explicitly said that an, an individual by virtue of his race or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. None of these things were ever said. He had to make an inference as a white man 
what was meant by this training. <laughs> Brad, did you make did you make this decision singly on your own? No, I did not. Yeah. Can, and we recognize that all legal conclusions and recommendations are made by inference from evidence. Even if you had a jury trial, there are everyone who's making a decision is making inferences based on evidence. So but why the government as a board member, have you been given the evidence? Have you gotten to listen to the audio? If that is the evidence, then oh, sure. Okay. But I have not I have not received any evidence. I, well, you've received the uh, the written evidence. But again, I if the evidence was in the audio, because you said that the decision was made based on the audio, not based on what was written or the slides, you as a board member, me as a board member, we have not received that audio, so we have not received that evidence. But if it is written, it is as it's if not we received. It wasn't written. But it's true. He well, said that well, it was different from what you, provi what you provided. And I think that this speaks to even a deeper conversation of because of the color of someone's skin, which you just referenced, Mr. Implicit uh, racial bias. Is Correct. the fact that because of the color of his skin, he's going to make decisions differently than you as a black woman. He is. And, but I think that's where we have to be wise enough as you've mentioned, take a look at the evidence. And when we speak to, does it make a difference if it's a third party that did it? Yes. Now, here's here's the reason why even greater uh, responsibility needs to be done on the district. It is their responsibility of oversight. If it's a third party, it is their responsibility to make sure that they adhere to 1775. And for that reason, we have to uh, yeah. go ahead and put them on the warning as we have a motion and a second on the table. Estella, here's, here's the statement that I have to make. Yes, as a black woman, my lived experience is polar opposite from yours, from Brad's, from Brian's, from Jennifer's. I mean, even me and Terry have different experiences as black women. That is to be expected. So for you to claim that I'm saying this because of the color of his skin, it's because of our lived experiences. It's because of the ways that we experience society. That is how implicit bias is formed. I have implicit biases, as do you, right? So these are the concepts that were being taught in that training. It has nothing, just because I bring up the color of someone's skin, I think that people get really sensitive about that. But that's why we need to have more explicit conversations about the intersectionality of gender, of race, because it shapes our lived experiences. It shapes the way that our students experience their time in the classroom, and it shapes the way that they receive their education. If we are blind to that, we are ignoring the ability to provide a high quality education to students in this state. So as you, and I respect your statement and your opinion on this, and everyone is going to have a different perspective and where they derive to that. Yes, of course, all of our experiences are different. However, when presented with evidence, when there are laws that are created, your opinion, your lived experiences, we also have to take into account how that's affecting and impacting the broader community, the state as a whole. And I bring that up because of we had one of the members um, speak to DEI, to where a lived experience of someone who is going through uh, gender dysphoria, let's say, and it's unfortunate, and then going through that experience, does that for someone else that may have a different experience, whether it's a biblical worldview or a non-biblical worldview. We look at the evidence and we look at science. There has to be a perspective as to where we're looking through those lens. And so for me or for those that are teaching DEI, for them to say that you must go against your experience of religious beliefs or what you were brought up is completely intrusive as to those biblical worldviews as she was mentioning as well. Same thing in this scenario. So those different experiences that you have lived, that I have lived, have to be this looked training, at. The evidence but, we saw it did, had, had nothing so, to do with So it. It, it does, because you have to look at the evidence. So either we're gonna look at what it part? through scientific evidence, experiences. So obviously if we're gonna do scientific evidence, we're not looking at that when we're trying 
to push a specific agenda of there are 10 genders. Okay, that's so, not a part no, of this it, discussion. No, but I have to bring that up into this discussion because you brought up lived experience. Implicit bias so doesn't have anything to do with gender dysphoria that, we, that was discussed by a public it's comment. A that had deeper, nothing to do with it's a deeper conversation that this body needs to have. And as we break down these, uh, uh, these different decisions and these motions that we're making, we do. We have to bring in all of those elements. And so it's important for us to, once again, look at the evidence. And what does the evidence show? And to me, and what you have mentioned, I'm not an attorney, nor are you. And so, therefore, we have to be able to listen to legal counsel. This is also the same legal counsel law. that you're listening to now that you wanted to not represent the board, right? Because you and didn't want to listen to them. Wait, and therefore, we have two, correct? So therefore, as wise individuals of the board, we have to look at everything as a whole and not be so narrow-minded and keeping our blinders on those personal experiences that will shape us, but also look at other experiences and say, you know, we do need additional information. We do need evidence. And what does the evidence show? And in this instance, the evidence is clear and it's showing a violation of 1775. All right. I think it's important to note that the emergency rule was not in effect um, until September 23rd, 2021. Need to keep that in mind. Um, no matter what anyone in this room feels about the law, we have a law. Uh, the law also has rules established with that. Um, and we know that this is a law that has a lot of vagueness. Um, I am also. Um, knowing that there is a lot of work put into um, finding the right uh, determination through examination. Um, there was due diligence. There was also um, um, work to discuss um, the findings with also the district. And there have there is before you a recommendation that does comply with the current rules um, regarding a vendor with the district. And that is a deficiency. Uh, it, I will say it is, in, in my opinion, um, an escalation that feels rather emotional. We've seen a lot of things in, um, on the news, through social media, that seem to be attacking um, various aspects of the children and the teachers and the personnel at Tulsa Public Schools because they are feeling that. And it's really, um, I think, important for us to focus back on what we are here to examine, which is some facts, um, recommendation, and following the rules that are in place today with the understanding of what was in place at the time under the state law and rules. And with that, I make the recommendation, can't make a motion, but I do wanna ask you as you are considering um, that you would follow the recommendations that have been put forward by the State Department of Education for deficiency, uh, which complies with the rules that you passed of 1775 in this particular context. Brad, what was the date of the training? Sorry, uh, I, I believe it was August of 2021. 21. Okay. And does Tulsa Public have other deficiencies right now besides 1775? There is one recommended at the district level relating to uh, monitoring from statewide assessments. Okay. Um, <clears throat> which is why we put them as the uh, multiple deficiency. That is what that status is when you have more than one. So this would be two. And then okay. uh, to go among the 70 or so sites within the district, I believe four have recommended um, recommendations for one deficiency. And then the others. All the rest. The recollection from the sheet is those are not recommended for any deficiency. Okay. So that is not uncommon.
All right. Now, um, there is a motion and a second on the table. And would you um, care anyone to have any further discussion about that? Are you pulling Tulsa off or are you up to handle or are you taking everything right now as a whole? No, ma'am, I pulled Tulsa off. I, okay. Yes, ma'am. And my, yeah, my motion to put them on warning immediately still stands. And just to clarify, that's, you're pulling Tulsa off, but are you also pulling out? Well, we may need to. I, I clarified the, the rat early on that we may need to take some of these out to discuss them because there's so many. Yeah. And that was. Are you wanting to do then a separate motion for? Tulsa, is that what you're asking for right this moment? That's you're not talking about that's exactly right. District. That's okay. exactly right. All right. So you are um, making a special motion only for Tulsa right now. Correct. Okay. All right. Then let's call the roll. Ms. Williams Bradley. No. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Bobek? Yes. Ms. Menes? Yes. Ms. Liebeck? Yes. Superintendent Meister? No. For more information, you can visit TulsaWorld.com.